The Victorian owners of large country houses surrounded themselves with flowers. Flowers decorated their rooms, they gave colour to their gardens, they adorned their persons. With this thought in mind, I took the road to Chiltern for another season in our Victorian garden. This will be the third time I've worked with head gardener Harry Dodson. First, it was to discover how the Victorians grew their fruit and vegetables, then to learn how they prepared them for the pot. Now we want to find out how they grew their flowers. With Harry's help, I'm going to travel back to an age before today's highly technical methods of producing house plants and cut flowers. The walled garden, its glass houses, cold frames and open plots will be put to work producing a continuous supply of flowers and decorative plants, just as it did a hundred years ago. Harry, good to see Peter. you. And you, welcome back to Chilton. Oh, it's good to be here. Mm -hmm. And you're getting the cut flowers in? Yes, this is the first of the gladioli going in. And you've got a new assistant to help you? Yes, David, come and meet Peter. Hello, David. Hello, pleased to meet you. Well, it's good to see you. And you're busy. Gladiolus gandavensis, a favourite of Queen Victoria. They're a bit small, but I suppose they're an old variety. They're a very old variety, Peter, yes. Uh, I don't mind them being as small as that, or a section yeah. being smaller, because they throw a smaller spike, and you know, sometimes when you're decorating, you yes. need some smaller spikes as well as the large ones. Because they'll all be for cut flour for the big this house. This is all cut flour, and the whole of this piece of grain yeah. is going to be cut flowers for the house. There will be all sorts here. There's dahlias and uh, the chrysanthemum maximum, and yeah. then there will be a good selection of uh, elichrysums and acrolinium and statis, all for dried work. For row after winter. row. Row after row, yes. Because it was a real crop, wasn't it? It was flowers. a crop, and what yeah. quite a number of people never understood was, you know, that these wall gardens were the production exactly. uh, yeah. of the old yeah. setup. This had to be done on a mini commercial scale to, to keep up with the supply. Well, it's good to uh, see it again, Harry. Mm, it is good to see it. I, I'm Absolutely. really pleased over it. It's really nice. Well, come and have a look at the other things. Oh, I'd love to. Going. Have a yes. really good poke round. Mm, shall I, think I, we should shall I go on first down yes, this path? David, you can carry on here. You know how far you've got to go. Yes, okay. And uh, fill them in when you finish. Lightly tread them and uh, rake it off. Right. Mm -hmm. right. I'll go forth, Harry. Yes, be a good uh, thing. Come and have a look at you. Many of the plants the Victorians liked most had only recently been introduced from the tropics. They needed the protection of what became known as the stove house. Harry already has this in mind. We realised we'd got to have a stove house and we've set aside this house for it. Oh, you're using uh, this one? We've got this one all cleaned up and it's all ready to start taking some plants in. Well, you made a job of it. Yes. How was uh, this heated in the old days? Uh, this was heated year in and year out, and the heat come through those pigeonholes. Ah, yes. There's batteries of pipes underneath here. Yes, uh, and, and then the, same on the other side. Yes, the sides will be staged up. Yeah. We've not made up our minds yet what we're going to do to this, but it's possible to take the top off of this and let it down onto the floor. So you can get bigger you pots, can get much bigger palms, pots there, that sort yes. of thing, sitting on the floor? That's right. Because they always the... needed a lot of air space. I mean, there's yes, they did big when stuff. They raised the... Not every plant required the heat of a stove house. In the same range, there would be cooler houses where less tropical plants were grown and their flowers displayed to visitors. Harry's show house was even now starting to fill with colour and interest. Well, it's, it's a great pleasure to see the air and lilies back here. And it's such a jolly good strain. They too. are good. They're strong, aren't mm. they? But look at the flower you've got on this clivia. Well, these clivias on the end, on either side, 
uh, have been here all the years that I've been here. <laughs> they look it. <laughs> Some old warriors, aren't they? They are, but the middle pot is a pot of seedlings which yeah. has never been split up. Yeah. And they were sown about five years ago. This is the first time they've come into flower. But what a shower flower. Mm. I always like this colour. It's, uh, it's showy without being gaudy. It's and, quite an uh, unusual colour, actually. It is. Flowers, it, it was a jolly good cut flower, too, you know, as yeah. well as a pot plant. Huge quantities of cut flowers were required to decorate the rooms of the mansion. The demand was heaviest when the family was in residence during the summer, but even in winter when they were in London, they still expected flowers to be sent to them. Victorian houses were large, gloomy and drafty. They needed bold, striking plants, yet many were too tender to survive such conditions. The ever-durable Aspidestra was an exception. As the century went on, floral decorations became more and more elaborate, and the stands to display them more intricate. In the bedroom, roses, violets and sweet peas were selected for their sweet scent and delicate form and colour. The rose was well chosen, notes one writer, because in an emergency it can be taken for personal decoration. The Victorian ball gave the head gardener his greatest challenge. A forest of greenery set off a procession of floral trim gowns. The discovery that plants gave out carbon dioxide at night led people to declare such vegetation unhealthy. But no dread of noxious exhalations, intoned the quarterly review, deters mamas or their daughters from braving the headaches and pale cheeks which are said to arise from such causes. Head gardeners always made a careful record of what they sent to the big house. Harry's predecessor was no exception. I have an old produce book here belonging to Mr Beckett's days and this goes back to just the turn of this century. This is the 20th of February, and to the house they sent five dozen snowdrops, seven dozen tulips, a dozen aconites. That was a fiddling job for somebody at that time of the year. And he goes on, six dozen daffodils, four dozen carnations, which was quite something then in, in the middle of the winter. The next two items are quite interesting. Lilac and rhododendrons, four dozen of each. This would have probably only been the heads broken off, but they'd undoubtedly had been grown in pots, which was the principle in those days, if that sort of thing was required, a collection of those items were in the gardens. Previously, open parkland and garden mingled in a seamless vista. Now nature was distanced from the house and formal grounds laid out. Shirley Hibbard wrote, Since the garden is a creation of our art, not a patch of wild nature, so it should everywhere show evidence of artistic taste. But as the century progressed, attitudes changed. There grew a reaction to the rigid formality of many great gardens. This was often expressed in a romantic yearning for the artless cottage garden, with its simple profusion of foxglove, hollyhocks and lilies. The importance of flowers in people's lives could be measured by the growing popularity of the flower show. When the London Horticultural Society held its first show in 1827, few attended. But by 1842, the Quarterly Review could report that they had done wonders in improving public taste. Flowers brightened the lives of the poor. 
In the London parks at the end of the season, it became the custom to give away plants. Women, children, working men, and even the inmates of the workhouse brought receptacles to fill with discarded geraniums, calcellarias, and lobelias. But no flower had quite the seductive appeal of the rose. Growing the old Victorian roses was a priority for Harry. Well, come so, and have a look at the roses, Peter. We've put this back oh, into production. You have. The ramblers have done quite well. Oh, well, this is all for cut flower. Ten months of the year, approximately, this supplied flowers. I've uh, seen it in all its glory two or three times. It's had a checkered life in yes. the last 14 years. This lovely old house uh, was put up for the specific purpose of roses. As far as I know of, from well before the beginning of the First World War, right up until the beginning of this Second World War, it was roses continuously. The preparation work that we've done here, although some of it's been quite hard work because we've had uh, some pretty solid foundations to break up, we've been able to incorporate this lovely, well-rotted old cane manure into the base of them. It's uh, between two and three years old, and it's absolutely ideal for this. Well, this is one of my favourites, Peter. It's a Noisetti climber, Madame Alfred Currier. It's a lovely flower in the bud. And that's uh, a, it's not unattractive when it becomes blue. It certainly isn't. Now, that's, a, that's what, a 19th century variety? Yes, yes, it is. You can see that by the form of the flower, can't you? But it is, it's... I mean, they're not as elegant as modern ones, but they, no. they have more character in a way. But there's summer, you know. I like a rose like that in a vase. It looks like a rose. Day. Yes, it does. I, I like that. I really <laughs> not do. like a plastic bud. <laughs> no. <laughs> It was a lovely place to bring the guests, of course, on a Sunday morning. <laughs> ah, yes. And, uh, <laughs> of course, it was a great privilege to the head gardener to be able to cut one off and present with the ladies in the, in the group. I can believe it. Yes. I can believe Done it. Done it many times. But... With various <laughs> <things. laughs> yes. It was a great privilege, really. It was very proud to have been part of it. Well, and that's a fine plant. There's no doubt about it. Yes, it is. have always been a thing that I've taken a great joy in growing, especially the flowers under glass, such as these sort of items. My earliest beginnings into the gardens was in the kitchen garden and the glass houses, and uh, that was always sort of my ambition, and it was where I was always... Uh, I think most at home. Um, I, I think also I love the, the quietness of the wall garden and the, then the same with the glass. And, uh, of course, you were generally uh, a snotch above the, uh, the other labourer if you uh, was good under the glass. The flower gardens and decorative walks surrounding the big house were known to the garden staff as the pleasure grounds. Here, the undergardeners laboured on the huge task of filling the endless flower beds. I never had a very great interest in my young days in the flowers and the pleasure grains and the bedding out. And I think a few times here in the past, I've wished that uh, I had paid more attention to 
pleasure grain work. All right, David, we're getting the turf off. The fashion for laying out huge formal beds in front of the house dominated the gardens of Victorian England. It's not within our means to recreate this on any scale, but Harry's game to try one curiosity, growing clematis as a bedding plant. Now I'm pretty certain this site that uh, I've chosen here with the dappled shade and back in this bit of a nook and on the end of the lawn, a path nearby that they could be seen from the lawn or from the path, uh, they should do well here. The soil is not all that deep, but one of the things in favour of this particular position is not far away is chalk and the clematis generally take quite kindly to the chalk. We've got a nice collection of plants here, three or four varieties. They've been pot grown, they're well rooted, but at the same time, the plant in no way has been starved, so they, they should do well. The soil will be firmly put around them and uh, they will be watered in immediately they've been done and uh, that should uh, suffice for the planting. The next stage uh, is to get some brushwood to cover the whole of the bed. Now this again is something which I never realised they did, but having studied it and looked deeper into it, yes they did. The uh, bed was covered with brushwood, uh, denuded foliage of course. Uh, we fortunately have got some very useful twigs here for it from uh, some of the uh, beech trees which suffered in the storm damage. It was such a storm that led to the discovery of this method. One night at the nurseries of Jackman and Son of Woking, the sticks supporting some seedlings were blown over. It was later noticed that these plants spread out their branches over the surface of the ground and flowered as profusely there as when elevated in the usual way. It's put onto the bed uh, roughly like a mound, higher in the middle than the sides, and uh, the clematis, the young shoots, as all shoots will, they go for the light, and they will wheedle their way up through this brushwood Later, they will be pegged and trained to create a carpet of blue in the summer. Another item, of course, which uh, can be grown in the same way as the clematis, uh, was roses and uh, we've got our bed of roses planted up here and reasonably established and now is the time to peg them down. Um, they need a somewhat stronger peg than the clematis because of course they will make some, some quite robust growth and uh, the, the peg has to be a, a little more substantial to hold it down. And, uh, of course, again, one needs more skill in pegging down the roses. Otherwise, uh, if you go at it erratically, you're going to break or crack some very useful shoots. Many months were spent scouting the country for varieties which the Victorians knew, but which now seemed lost. In the case of the carnations, we were lucky. 
Harry obtained enough old types from a Hampshire nurseryman to give us some idea of the Victorian carnation. There's always been quite a certain amount of, of trouble and, and problems with the naming of plants. And if you, you've been used to a name for quite a few years or it's a name that you were taught when you was a nipper just leaving school or you was clever enough to have remembered from before you left school, you found it very, very difficult to change. Uh, I suppose it was necessary, but to an ordinary gardener, uh, quite a lot of it was difficult to explain. It wasn't only changed names that proved difficult. Often it was identifying the plants in the first place. In the woodland behind the garden at Chilton, a mass of daffodils gives colour each spring. Here, hidden away, is a treasure trove of old varieties. Harry's sure they go back to the Victorian period, but their names are long lost. This is one of the, uh, the later ones, probably. There are some in this orchard much, much later than this. Uh, well, I remember them from several old gardens of my boyhood days. And my uncle had told me on several occasions that he never knew the name of them. And I took over two or three old staff here in 1947 who had been working in these gardens uh, previous to the First World War. And they said they never ever remembered these being planted. It's quite possible that uh, old Mr Beckett's planted them in his early days here. But I would imagine that they were even varieties that had been around quite a few years before then. We later discovered that some were varieties that had been bred by Peter Barr, a Victorian nurseryman who specialised in daffodils. Harry tags the plants in preparation for lifting the bulbs later in the summer. They will be potted to decorate the mansion in the depths of winter. Once the flowers have died, Harry employs a novel way of taking their heads off. One of my earliest recollections of de Ed in the daffodil uh, was in the vicarage gardens. And the, the rector asked me if I would go and de Ed his daffodils because he, he didn't want them to regenerate. And he took me to the edge row at the bottom of his orchard and cut a swishy uh, hazel stick out, uh, about a yard to four feet long, and he showed me how to flick it over the uh, edge of the daffodils, and that took them off as clean as a whistle. And it had a great appeal to me because it was far easier than picking them off individually by hand. The herbaceous border of hardy perennials went out of favour when the fashion for bedding plants was at its height. But as the tide turned against the formal bed, the mixed border made a comeback. Astonishingly, Chilton can provide an authentic location. Yes, well, this is where it's all going to be planted. Harry. This is where it's about to take place. That's tremendous. And what a joy it is to, to see this planted back up again with herbaceous plants. Now, you say back up again, this was the old central walk of the gardens? This was the central walk of the gardens, and it was all herbaceous plants in the family colours. <laughs> there was apple trees at the back, yeah. and it, it was all banked up here. It was was quite good but it was it was very difficult to to keep up and the wrought iron gate at the bottom down there was put yeah. there so that the locals could enjoy the border on their Sunday afternoon and Sunday evening really? walks and it was known locally as the pretty opening
this fine old photograph is of the herbaceous border some 90 odd years ago. It was a very difficult border uh, to plan and to get to perfection because it was done in blue and a light straw yellow. And the other handicap was that it had to flare uh, late July and the first fortnight of August. It truly is a lovely picture. And I'm hoping that the border that we're going to create for the new series will come up to this. But we will be having a wider range of colour in our border than there was permitted in this one. But I'm hoping to follow these lines by the end of July, August time. I'm hoping our border will be filled in as much as this and no soil will be visible to the eye. In 1871, William Sutherland published the Handbook of Hardy Herbaceous Flowers. In it, he urged the creation of borders where the individuality of the plants is not altogether swallowed up in the general effect. Hollyhocks and foxgloves are certainly not plants to be engulfed and will provide height at the back of our border. Asphodel's made a lot of growth, Harry. It's done well in the short space of time it that has, we've had yeah, it. Yeah, indeed it has. It really has. The little statue, is that original? Yes, that's been here all the years that I've been here. It's a bird bath, actually. Oh, I see now, It used now, to be yes. erected each year about the beginning of May and would be dismantled again at the end of August, beginning of September. Oh. 